Hi folks, thanks very much for joining me. So, uh, I would like this to have been a, a live broadcast on YouTube, but after looking into the expense of getting the various uh, hardware that I would need to achieve that, I've decided to do it in this format. It's not quite the same, but um, I'm hoping that you still get something out of it. So what I did was I asked um, folks that subscribe to my YouTube channel to give me some questions and I would do my best to answer them. Obviously, I'm, I'm no expert by any stretch, but I've, I've been doing this for a long time and hopefully I can give you some information that will help. So without further ado, let's have a look at some of the questions we got sent in. So the first one was from Clive Turner. I seem to have trouble getting hold of good quality materials. One in particular is peacock eyes to strip. Can you suggest where I can get larger, wider quills for size 10 hooks? Many thanks, great videos, keep safe. Well, thanks Clive. Um, peacock eyes, strip peacock eyes, um, I used to like you get what I could get a hold of and I would strip them with uh, either a pencil rubber or I would use the, the nail on my thumb and just strip them by hand which often resulted in them snapping and not being very good. But uh, I've, I've done away with all that now. I think um, you're much better spending the extra pennies and just buying pre-stripped quills and I can heartily recommend a couple of them. Um, Troutline do an absolutely stunning strip peacock quill and if you didn't want to send out to Romania direct from Troutline, I believe Ian Gillard uh, Get Slotted stocks these quills. They're absolutely fantastic. The other ones that I've found are really defined in, in their width and I think that's what you're talking about is the Polish quills. Uh, they're absolutely superb. Now there's a number of retailers in the UK do them and uh, I would, again, I can heartily recommend the Polish quills. I hope that answers your question. Thanks very much for uh, posing it. Question two comes from Ben Socket. When fishing on rivers, how do you choose which fly to use depending on colour of water, how much water is in the river, time of day, year? Do you have a go-to pattern for coloured water over clear water? Many thanks, Ben. Keep up the great videos. Thanks, Ben. Um, it, quite a lot, a lot to that question. There's, there's like 20 questions in one there. Uh, so I'll try and answer as best I can. So it really does depend on the conditions. You can be looking at a river that has had a lot of flood water and that'll have had runoff from the banks, which has coloured up the water. Or you may be looking at a river that's very low. Um, my home waters the River Avon and uh, it's a chalk stream river, it's, it's not particularly deep, uh, certainly the areas that I fish it, it, it's not deep. So I would always tend to start with something like a parachute Adams uh, and start with that approach. If I wasn't getting any joy with a dry fly, um, I would very quickly change to little nymphs and my go-to sort of nymph would be a Mary nymph. Um, on the chalk streams and that would generally always get me a result. Now, as I said, it's quite a complicated question you've asked. It, it just depends on what the conditions are like. With muddy water or, or less clear water, I would always opt for darker nymphs. So black shows up much better in, in muddy water than, say, a lighter cream nymph. So I would always go for darker nymphs. Um, it's, it's quite a difficult question actually, I, I could talk for hours on this sort of subject but uh, I, I don't want the video to trail on. So I hope that's kind of answered your question. If not, please come back to me and I'd be happy to um, elaborate on any of the answers I've given. Question three then comes from Chris McCarthy. What tippet do you use when you're fishing dries, Lindsay? When it's calm, I have problems getting the tippet through the film. Well, uh, I'm not sure whether you're talking about rivers or you're talking about lock style fishing. Now, for lock style fishing, um, people argue night and day that you should switch from fluorocarbon to copolymer and the copolymer won't sink. I don't agree with that. I, uh, I used to use copolymer, I used to use um, double strength drenin in six pounds 
and uh, that that done me for for years fishing dries but i've now come across to the uh the fact that fluorocarbon is just mu a much better material to use now it naturally sinks because of the 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 makeup of the material and i would use um real fluoroflex plus and six pound fluorocarbon for fishing um dries on a still water now for the river fishing again i wouldn't change from fluorocarbon i would still use the fluorocarbon but i would use it in sort of 2.5 to 3 pound breaking strain i hope that answers your question thanks for posing it question four then is from mark anderson most used leader setup when fishing reservoirs type and make of material breaking strain number of droppers okay mark that's that's fairly specific and um you probably you you sound like you're very like-minded uh, i'm very stringent or i certainly used to be very stringent with my leader makeup for the reservoir and what that makeup would consist of generally for an average day's fishing i would use real fluoroflex plus an eight and a half pound breaking strain to my first fly would be 10 feet of tippet material and then my first dropper would go on and then I would have three feet to my next fly then a further three feet to my next fly and then another three feet to my point fly and that would give me an overall leader length of 22 feet which is fine in a boat you, you don't have any problems casting with that and that would be my standard go-to setup and I think that's answered your question. But what I would like to say to you is over the last few years, I have, I've got more into not doing that. And, and the re there's reasons for this is competition anglers and, and pleasure anglers as well carry quite a lot of fly lines now. There's, there's lots of choice available to anglers. And each fly line will affect your leader differently. So if I'm fishing a floater, if I've got 10 foot of fluorocarbon to my first fly, then obviously the fluorocarbon is going to drag that first fly under slightly. So what I tend to do now is depending on what line I'm fishing, I will test and adjust to suit my needs. So for example, if I was fishing dry flies, I would only fish at a maximum four feet away from the fly line. And then I would have um, my first dry fly, as my first dropper then I would go two feet to my next dropper and maybe three feet to my last dropper and that would be my dry fly setup now again taking a step back if I was fishing a midge tip I would maybe now take away the first four feet of that 10 foot of tippet and then carry on uh, with that first setup that I described to you. So it's it's not as straightforward as what is your standard setup. That, that, that would be my standard setup, but I would have to adjust it um, depending on conditions, depending on the fly line I was using. Uh, and here's a great example. In competition anglers, we, we get a hard deal really. You know, we turn up at venues and you, you're expected to go out and fish regardless of the conditions and the water's probably been quite heavily pressured by all the competition anglers practicing. But what I've, I've done in the past is when conditions are pretty horrific and I've been out in some pretty wild weather and it's blown a hooli, I will always go to my default setting, which is a DI7, it's a 10, 10 foot of tippet and I fish a single booby and that's generally a candy floss booby. And, and people say to me, well, you know, what if the fish aren't taking that? Well, uh, what I would say is, and my answer to that is, well, they will take it any time of year. The candy floss booby will catch your fish, but it's better to fish one fly effectively than spend half your day in the bottom of the boat knitting a four fly cast that you've been trying to fish away in a big blow with four droppers on. Pointless. You know, I've, I've sat in the boat with these guys, competent, proficient anglers that have spent half their day in the bottom of the boat retying leaders and I've been fishing away with my single booby 
and it might not be the most effective way to catch fish, but because I'm fishing it effectively and efficiently, I will eventually grind out one or two fish. I hope that answers your question, Mark. It was a great question. Thanks for asking it. Question five comes from DCG. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, hi, Lindsay. Love the videos. My question is, when you're fishing a river, how many spare spools do you carry? And can you explain the different setups on each spool? Example, dry fly spool, four weight double taper line, 12 foot tapered leader, five times and 5x, three feet of 6x, fluorocarbon added to leader, nymph spool, wet fly, streamer spool, dry, dropper spool, uh, DCG, that's a lot of question uh, in one paragraph there, so I'll just tell you how, how I approach the river. Um, when I'm being diligent, I might add, when I'm being lazy, I only take one rod and I make do with that. But when I'm being diligent and, and I want to really sort of give myself a little test, and that's, if you fish the same river all the time, the way to keep it interesting is give yourself little challenges. And what I do is I'll say, right, I want to catch five fish in an hour or I'll, I'm going to look at this 50 metres of river and I'm going to fish every single bit of it. And, and I often pick bits of river that generally I wouldn't get excited about. So I'll pick tough looking water and I'll spend a couple of hours trying to just grind out a couple of fish because I think that's how you improve. You know, if you do things that you, you might not like, but it will improve you. So how would I approach the river? I generally set up two rods. One rod would be a dry fly rod. And, and up until this year, um, I would take an Orvis 8 foot 6 for a 3 as a dry fly rod and I would have that with a, a 9 foot tapered leader and I would take a foot off the butt section of that tapered leader and a foot off the, the thin end. I would attach a micro ring to the uh, thin end and I would attach the butt section to the fly line and then I would add the tippet material to my dry fly, maybe two or three feet of tippet material, which would give me an overall leader length of around 11 foot um, for dry fly fishing. And now with that rod, I can also change to dual very quickly. And so it's dry fly dual. I also use it at a pinch for streamers, but to be honest, I don't, I don't fish streamers a great deal on my local water. Uh, if at all. The other rod I would take is uh, a 10 foot Hanak Superb and that would be rigged up with a French leader and uh, the French leader is a whole different question so I'm not going to go into how I would set that up but basically we'd have a single nymph um, five foot away from an indicator on a French leader and then I would take them two rods down to the river and do whatever I was going to do fishing wise. I hope that answers your question. Uh, if not, again, please feel free to come back to me and I'll try and elaborate on, on that. The next question is from Mike Robinson. Hi Lindsay, what's your go-to pattern for fishing the duo on rivers? I.e. the pattern that you use for detecting if a fish has taken one of the nymphs. Also, what length of tapered leader do you like to use from the butt end if the fly line straight through to the dry fly, which suspends the nymph? Okay, um, thanks for the question, Mike. Uh, it's, it's a good question, actually, because the duo is a method I absolutely love fishing. It's a, it's a visual, you catch lots of fish doing it, and um, it's great uh, fun. I, I really enjoy it. It's one of my favorite um, methods. So my go-to indicator fly is what you're asking, I think. Now, it, again, it depends on the water I'm fishing. If it's slow canally water that I can afford to fish quite a light dry fly, I love fishing the parachute atoms. It not only will suspend a light nymph below it, it's, it's just very, very takeable for the fish and I often catch as many fish on the dry fly as I do on the nymph. So the parachute arms would be my go-to fly when the water's really calm. I've not got much problems with it staying afloat. 
parachute arms without a doubt. Now for rougher, more tumbly water and certainly freestone river water, if I'm fishing the duo, which I'm doing a lot less of nowadays actually, I, I tend to find that I'm either fishing dry fly or I'm fishing nymph. I, I don't tend to fish the duo on the uh, the, the freestone rivers as much but when I do I like to use something called a cider sedge and I'll, I'll stick a little bar up there that you can see how that's tied uh, it's really buoyant and it'll suspend a spend an end with a two millimeter tungsten bead on it no problem at all it does take the occasional fish but it generally is a sacrificial fly that um, will suspend the nymph now the distance that I have my nymph from my indicator fly will vary and, and that's going to vary on depending on what river you're fishing, what speed of water you're fishing in but generally as a general rule of thumb I wouldn't have it much more than a couple of feet away from the dry fly. I hope that answers your question Mike, thanks very much for asking it. Okay question seven comes from Jason King, how does your casting change when faced with tricky water with multiple different speed of currents between you and your target seam? That's a, an excellent question Jason and um, it's, it's not easily answered actually. Uh, what I would say is if I've got, as you, you suggest here, that there's various currents going to interfere with your fly line, and I take it that's what you mean, you've cast your fly across and it's immediately been impacted by the other flows in the river and the different sections, then the simple answer is you've got to get into a better position. And, and the way you do that, if, if it's safe, you, you come down from your target seam and you cross the river so that you can get at an angle of 45 degrees keeping as much fly line off the water as possible so that it doesn't affect the drag. Now you're always going to get drag on rivers, especially in quick currents. Um, if that option is not possible to you, so crossing the seam is not possible because it's either too deep or it's moving through it too much of a force, then what you can do, and I don't like doing this, is getting as much slack into your cast as possible. So shaking out some slack line and what that will give you is the very, very briefest of window where you're not getting any drag on your flies, it hits your target seam. But that window is like one to two seconds and then immediately you've got drag if you've got that quick current. The other option of course is you wade down to where it is safe to cross, you cross the river to the opposite bank and then you can fish your targets. Okay, the next question's from Stephen Holmes. Uh, your top five wild brown trout flies, top five salmon flies, and top five stock trout flies. I think it would be very helpful for everyone. Cheers and keep up the great videos. You help me a lot with them. Stephen, thanks very much for the question. Um, okay, salmon fishing. Uh, I've tried salmon fishing, Jock Ryan's tried relentlessly to get me to catch a salmon and I have let him down every time. The only time, I have caught two salmon in my life and uh, the only time I did that was when I was bugging for grayling. So unless you want me to say I, uh, I squirmy wormy and a pink nymph, then I don't think that's helping salmon anglers particularly well. I do like to tie the odd salmon fly, I quite enjoy the tying experience, but um, as for salmon fishing, it, it, it kind of bores me, I, no offence to salmon anglers, but standing in a river and um, throwing a double hander around, I'm told once you catch one it's great fun, but you can spend like years not catching one, and uh, that's not my bag, I really enjoy catching fish. Now the wild brown trout, I, I, I don't... I, I love fishing for them on rivers, uh, but I think you're talking about reservoirs and lochs, uh, forgive me if I'm wrong. Uh, I haven't done a great deal of that, but I was hoping to get up this year to Malin Tarn with uh, Rob Dennison and, and give the old wild, wild brownies a go, and uh, I've got some flies that I think may work, um, but I, I couldn't guarantee it. Um, if you want to know about wild brown trout flies, uh, you need to be speaking to the like of Rob Dennison. They, they'll be able to steer you right in that direction. Now, as for stocked, um, stocked reservoirs, I've got a number of flies that I can absolutely recommend will catch you 
a lots of fish. So number one then, the candy floss booby. I mean, I, I, it doesn't need any introduction really. This fly is absolutely devastating everywhere I've been to fish it. Um, in teeth, Rutland, Chew, Brennig, it, it doesn't matter. It just works. It's really good. And if I could only be tied down to one fly, this would be it. Next, the fire shitting blob. It's actually a fab. Um, again, this is a fly that any time of the year, it's going to catch you a lot of fish. Fairly easy to tie and uh, guaranteed to put some fish in your bag. And the last three, I'm going to show you variations of this, these patterns because um, they're all different, except for the last one, which I, I thought I should put a dry fly in because uh, I don't want to seem like a heathen. So next, so number three on my list would be the cruncher. Uh, the cruncher in all its various guises is an absolutely superb fly and um, I'd, I'd happily fish these all year round in different sizes, different colours and, and they'll catch you fish, no bother at all. I wouldn't be without buzzers. Now, early season I like really shiny, heavy buzzers that's going to get me down to where the fish are feeding and um, the one I've shown you here is one that I would um, absolutely have no reservations about tying on early season. In fact, I'd tie four of these on my casts and um, be perfectly happy to catch fish. And last but not least, just in case I got some dry fly fishing, and it's a rare occurrence, um, and it was a bit of a flip of a coin, if I'm perfectly honest, because I really love fishing hoppers. Uh, I think they're a great dry fly, they represent lots of different patterns, but in the end, for stocked rainbow trout, you cannot beat this fly, the Midas. So, I hope that's been of some use. That's my, my, my top five flies for uh, taking stock fish. And I hope that answers your question, Stephen. Thanks very much for asking it. The next question comes from David Halliday. It would be interesting to find out what line do you consider using with what flies when you first start fish a lock or a small still water? Great videos, thanks. Thanks very much, David. So uh, I kind of, I think I've answered that in, in some of the previous questions, but just to um, just to elaborate on it, it, it all depends on the uh, on the lock or the lake you're fishing. Um, I've been to some, you know, if I'm approaching the likes of Rutland, it would be a very much different experience to approaching Manningford, for example. You know, a small stocked pond to a large stocked pond uh, would would warrant two different approaches. Um, for the small waters, generally you'll find that you don't need much more than a floating line, which is great for, especially for guys just starting out fly fishing. You know, you go to these small fisheries, you know, they're maybe 15 feet at their deepest, and if you've got a, a heavy bug on, you're getting to them depths, and, and a floating line is doing all that. So it's, it's a relatively low budget affair. If you go to the larger reservoirs, the likes of Rutland, Grafham, Pittsford, you, you're going to have to um, open up your inventory a bit and get intermediates and fast sinking lines. So it, it, again, it all depends on the weather, what's been happening on the reservoir. And uh, I would always warn asking the guys that work in the shop will tell you exactly what to do. So I hope that's kind of uh, answered your question there, Stephen. Thanks very much for asking it. And the last question, I'm glad it's the last question, is from Robert McLaughlin. I hope I've spelled, um, I hope I've pronounced that correctly, Robert. I struggle with teal mallard wings. Do you need to have matching opposite sides or is there an easy way? Well, if there's an easy way, I've not found it. I struggle myself with wings. Uh, it's something I've had to practice um, to get right. And, and what I would say, with, with mallard wings, certainly, you definitely need two opposite feathers. So a feather from the left wing, a feather from the right wing. Cut your slips, marry them up, and then that makes life a hell of a lot easier. Um, as for easy way, uh, you know, everything's easy when you know how to do it. 
that that's true, isn't it? You know, if I'm demonstrating something that I'm very confident with, it looks easy, but for somebody just learning, it, it's not. What I would say is, for wings, Davy McPhail's your man. Uh, I often, even now, I still go to his channel. How's he doing it? Because every time I tie wings, I have my good days and I have my bad days. I'm not. I, I don't consider myself particularly good at fly tying, actually. Uh, certain things I'm very good at because it's it's what I use to fish with. But other things, it's it's learning for myself, and that's one of the beauties of doing the YouTube channel. It's forced me into tying flies that I find quite challenging, and uh, I like that because it means I'm learning. So, sorry, there's no easy way. You've got to get on the vice, get on Davy McPhail's channel. And, uh, and just keep practicing until you get it right. So, that was uh, the last question, guys. Uh, I hope it's been of some use. It's, it's been good fun. I've quite, I've quite enjoyed um, answering it. I'd have quite liked to have done the live interaction thing, but at the moment, I, just, I can't justify the cost of buying the hardware to achieve that. But uh, this, this seemed to work quite well for me. Uh, how it was for you guys, I'm not so sure. Please let me know in the comments. Uh, if you've enjoyed it, I'm happy to do it again. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please think about clicking on the subscribe button. And I'll see you all next time.